Okay, so there's many, many topics within this, and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm certainly going to go over some of the common issues that we deal with. Uh, how should we proceed? How do we network and interact with our other specialists? Because we clearly need help. So if we look at three major groups, group one would be reactive manifestations of IBD. Two would be IBD-related complications secondary to metabolic or anatomic abnormalities. And three, non-IBD specific autoimmune diseases, which we also have to face, Bichette's, diabetes, anemia, et cetera. So what's group one? That's the reactive. That's what you deal a lot with. And we have to sort out with these patients, when is it related to inflammation in the gut, which we're dealing with, and when is it not? And that's when you're going to be use, use a, refer your, your special, to your specialist. So we have musculoskeletal, dermologic, ocular, and hepatobiliary, and we have many other, other diseases too. And we usually we have to divide this into those that parallel bowel inflammation, those that are independent. And that's really important. And it would be interesting to know how many people in this room have joint pains? Okay, everybody, good. And how often do you ask your patients if you have joint discomfort if they don't bring it up? And, very good, excellent, thank you. And I have found that when I start asking them, though they said they were perfectly fine, they had no complaints, over 60% of the patients that I'd be seeing had some form of joint discomfort. So that's really important. And then you have to sort that out. Is it related to their inflammation or not? And often with these patients, it's not. So how do you approach those patients? So parallel disease activity is easier for us. Arthritis type 1, we'll go over that. Enodosum. Uh, apthystomatitis, and even episcleritis. There you're really managing their IBD. Inflammation independent is really the critical part. Pyoderma, uvi uveitis, axial arthritis, and PSC. And these patients really do require very specific treatment, and you have to work with your specialist with these patients. The group two patients are related to IBD complications. We obviously see lots of patients. We osteoporosis, kidney stones, very common, even some rare, but patients with secondary amyloidosis, thromboembolic events, very important. That's a whole lecture which we're not going to discuss, but I did provide slides. Uh, interstitial lung disease, though we think itself as allergy, and I recently had a patient who had interstitial lung disease. The pulmonary interstitial lung experts were convinced it was from a salami. So it isn't just uh, sulfur drugs. Prevalence, prospective study from Switzerland showed that 43% of patients with Crohn's and 31% of patients with UC have at least one extraintestinal manifestations. More common in Crohn's, 15%, 8% UC have two or more extraintestinal manifestations. And again, as you know, peripheral arthritis is the most common EIM in both Crohn's disease and UC. And all of them are more common in Crohn's except pyoderma and PSC. So what about musculoskeletal? We have the axial, and we have two forms of peripheral arthritis. Axial, we have sacroiliitis and ankylosing spondylitis, but all these subtypes are broad class of musculoskeletal diseases called seronegative, so they have negative RA factor. Sacroiliitis is more mild, thus often asymptomatic in lower back, but there was a Spanish study that actually looked at 62 IBD patients without axial symptoms, 24% underwent M 24 undergoing MRI had changes consistent with disease, and ankylosing spondylitis, which we see fairly commonly. Remember, since this is not just lumbar but cervical, you have to ask your patients not only about buttock pain, back pain, but also chest pain. So some of the patients you're seeing actually have chest pain from ankylosing spondylitis, and unfortunately, this is often independent of the gut inflammation. And almost all of these patients have HLA-B27 go on to develop uh, ankylosing spondylitis. In a retrospective study of patients with ankylosing spondylitis and OGI symptoms, two-thirds of these patients had evidence of inflammation, ileal inflammation on colonoscopy. And chronic inflammatory gut lesions were found in more than half patients with classic AS, and 10% developed IBD after two to nine years of follow-up, more Crohn's uh, than you see. What kind of treatment is there? I wouldn't do this myself. Yes, physical therapy, you can use COX-2 inhibitors. They can be responsive to anti-TNF, very small studies, also with adalimumab. But these are the patients you obviously want to refer to your rheumatologist, really, really important. Peripheral arthritis, we know about the type 1. That's the classic. It mirrors inflammation. 
type 2 is less common, but I seem to see a lot of patients. I don't know if it's the Northeast or not. You know, Philly, they have it, but maybe not North Carolina. It's a little bit warmer. I'm not really sure. But if you look at type 1 and type 2, so type 1, it, it follows the, the, the IBD itself. It's usually less than two joints. It's mainly large, the way you were taught originally. But then type 2 is a lot of small joint aches when I ask my patients, and they're actually doing well. And it's very independent. It can be seen with uveitis and not very easy for you to treat. That's important. Management, we talk about physiotherapy, rest splints. Send them to your rheumatologist. That's what you have to do. Obviously, with type 1, you're treating the patients because it's parallel with inflammation of the gut. But in the type 2, where you have multiple joints, x-rays are normal. You don't find anything on physical exam, but they have a lot of aches, a lot of small joint aches. It can be very difficult to treat these patients, but you need to work with the rheumatologist. Sulfazalazine, all treatments, sometimes the rheumatologists use it. Studies are not very good. Mesalamine, they will use in high dose, but not very good. If they don't work, of course, there's methotrexate, 6-MP, and anti-TNF. But again, I would say that if you're taking care of IBD patients, you really need to work together with the rheumatologist. Osteoporosis, people in this room have it. Reduction in bone mineral defined as two standard deviations, and, and that's what we do very badly with most of our patients. It's very, very common in patients uh, with IBD. Osteopenia can be as high as 70%. It was an interesting study about a decade ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine that showed taking five milligrams of prednisone a day for a year results in osteopenia and the beginning of osteoporosis. So there's really no such thing as a safe dose of corticosteroids. Fortunately, we don't have patients except those who have renal insufficiency who can't get off uh, prednisone itself. Lots of risk factors, reduced physical activity, steroids. Everybody in the Northeast, I don't know about Philly, it's a little... I had vitamin D. Everybody has vitamin D deficiency. You'll see posters here, 10,000 units a day. Maybe it's going to help. I'm not sure. Uh, but I make sure that everybody is on adequate vitamin D. And there was a good study in the New England Journal about two years ago showing that vitamin D deficiency was really more important than calcium in the general population for osteoporosis. Um, medications. We don't use cyclosporin very much, but methotrexate can contribute. Budesonide's been better, but not perfect, not quite as good as we were led to believe. Azathioprine 6-MP doesn't seem to have an effect, and there's some little bitty data on the fliximab that may actually increase uh, bone marrow density. This is still old, about 12 years old now, the AGA recommendations. I just wanted to point out the right upper corner, um, just again, because I think the key is vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D. Smoking, you'll never get them to stop. If it's UC, they'll get better, so they won't listen to you. Drinking, it depends on their genes and what they like. Again, really, I think we've done much better now minimizing corticosteroids, and that's very important. So these are basic things we can do, and also getting DEXA scans every two years. What about the skin? Anybody have any skin, skin problems here? Okay, no, we have perfect people again. So you have to worry about enodosum, aphthoid stomatitis, pyoderma, sweets, metastatic, there really probably another dozen uh, at our IBD course. We had the chair of uh, Brown speaking on uh, uh, skin rashes, and there must be another 20 kinds. So um, do the best you can. It's not always easy. So again, some are parallel with the disease itself, and some don't. Again, enodosum is most common. It can affect up to 15% of Crohn's patients. Interestingly, more in women. Deep tendon nodules can be anywhere in the trunk and arms. It's not just in the front. And it's inflammation that occurs in the subcutaneous fat and can occur wherever it's present. And here's the typical you'll find, but you can, these nodules can be anywhere, but you also have to be careful if they have a fever are you, and they travel. Maybe they're in the southeast or they have histoplasmosis or southwest. Yersinia is a little unusual. Salamena can do it, bichettes, um, sulfonamides, or contraceptives. So a, lot, a large differential for enodosum, just because they have IBD, don't just assume it's due to the IBD. Uh, treatment, it often responds to treatment for the disease. Enodosum can precede IBD in about 2 to 3 percent of cases, and patients who have idiopathic enodosum uh, should be evaluated uh, for IBD. Aphthoid stomatitis, common to everyone. Shallow ulcers, there's a picture. You can't really differentiate it from late stage HS HSV. It could be Bichette's, Kaksaki virus, HIV. Um, obviously, I'm sure you all have patients say they're starting to get mouth sores, and then their IBD flares. 
So it usually follows the course of the IBD. If it doesn't, you have to think that it's not from their IBD itself. Pyoderma gangrenosum, you've all dealt with it, not easy. Ulcerated skin lesions begin as tender uh, papules or vesicles, develop into painful ulcers. Uh, there's necrotic tissue. You can't grow organisms. The pathogenesis is still not clear. There's a nice picture, lovely, before dinner. I've left out a lot of the moogly pictures because dinner is coming. There's another, oh, it gets worse. Can also be in your back, can be anywhere. And of course, you've all dealt with it around the stoma. That can be a real problem. Uh, more common in UC, but also present in Crohn's. RA, it's common. In hemologic malignancies, 10 to 11%. Lots of treatments. I'll give you one of my special treatments, which none of the speaker mentions, from 1981. Dressings, topical steroids, tacrolimus, never debride, work with your dermatologist. But something that's effective and not very severe pyoderma is chromalin sodium, because chromalin sodium will um, uh, help prevent release of mast cells. And the trick is you take a 100 uh, milligram capsule, you open it up, put 100 cc's in sterile saline, so it's 1% and you, they put it on two or three times a day on the open sore, and it actually can start to heal a pyoderma, and it's perfectly safe. Um, you don't really find that used much, but it definitely helps my patients who don't have severe pyoderma. But again, I try to work with the, the dermatologists in our IBD center, we have a dermatologist, just like we have rheumatologists, and that's the key. Systemic therapies, well, we talked about it, steroids, all our drugs uh, for treating IBD, um, there's alternative therapies, anything you can think of from hyperbaric oxygen in space to uh, mycophenolate, tacrolimus, work with your dermatologist. Sweet syndrome, very sweet. It's an acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis, tender nodules. You have to differentiate it from enodosum. There's a leukocytosis. Uh, histologic findings, a neutrophilic infiltrate. It can be associated with fever, arthritis, and ocular symptoms, and it does respond to steroids. Again. If you're not sure, you're not dermatologist, work with your dermatologist. Metastatic Crohn's disease, very interesting. Most commonly in the skin, um, ulcerating nodules. Can sometimes be hard to tell, is this some funny you know, dosum or a beginning pyoderma? Uh, usually on the abdominal anterior wall, and it parallels gut inflammation. And it does respond usually to steroids and sometimes even to 5-SA drugs. What about PSE? You've heard lots of talking about PSE in the conference, again, so common in UC. Only about 5% of patients with UC will develop PSE. Only 1% to 2% of Crohn's patients. And UC patients with pancolitis are more at risk and less sighted. And of course, you see it uh, much more commonly in males. Um, interesting, what about colon cancer? There's a, there was a poster this week about, oh, we're all gonna die from PSE, and you better hurry up and do colons all the time. But what's interesting about patients, as you know, with PSC, the young males, usually the UC is very mild, and you colonoscope them every one or two years, and there's nothing there. And they go, why, why do I have to do this? There's an interesting paper that's sort of been hidden that showed that the real in um, incidence of colon cancer was in folks over 40 with the disease. Though it, it's a bit difficult when you have patients 20 years old, 22, to tell them you have to come in every one to two years. Um, I'm glad I haven't seen colon cancer yet in PSC. Uh, so that's still the recommendation, and there's a medical legal issue about not doing that. Again, the bottom line is now Urso probably doesn't help. The ASLD guidelines is not to use it. Um, I don't know how many people here use the lower dose Urso. Anybody using it at all? Okay, there's been no voting today. We'll skip that. Um, so it's still a little bit unclear. Many, many drugs have been tried. You've heard the uh, cycling this week about, oop, maybe vitalizumab as an antigrin inhibitor. Maybe it'll be helpful. We don't know. It's going to take a long time to find out because once these people have ERCP, they already have beating, changes in the ducts. You can't really change those, uh, but you're trying to avoid large duct disease. Uh, unfortunately, people do really quite well. Uh, what about your eyeballs? I don't know if people have glasses here. Episcleritis isn't bad. Remember, though, if you have patients on steroids, they may not have symptoms, but posterior cataracts, so you should have your patients examined regularly. But it's, episcleritis is painless hyperemia, and it does parallel um, IBD activity. 
Uveitis, you have to be a lot more worried about. They complain about blurry vision. Uh, they probably will need topical steroids, but make sure uh, when they tell you it's blurry that uh, they go see the uh, ophthalmologist. So in summary, EIMs are very common. We didn't even talk about other classes. Most common is still peripheral arthritis, osteoporosis, cenodosum. And again, work with your uh, specialists. Try to identify certain specialists that are interested and work with them on a regular basis. Thank you very much.